Do you want to know how to sell on the phone, how to negotiate on the phone, how to get through objections, how to get your mindset right and halt them all? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Daniel Nykart. He is a sales coach and a business mentor. You can find out more about him over at salesremaster.com. We're diving into selling on the phone, negotiating, and a whole lot more. So with all that said, let's jump right in. Daniel, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, Will. Appreciate having me. I'm glad to have you on. Okay, so negotiating over the phone. Do sales professionals negotiating over the phone have an advantage or disadvantage to those meeting and negotiating in person? Good question. I think they have a bit of both. Um, they have a disadvantage because they're not able to see the prospect in person. They, you know, obviously have to be prone to any excuse that the prospect can give them as in I'm going into a meeting or I can't take the call right now or, you know, call me later. You know, so they have just this whole plethora of or this wider range of objections that they're going to meet. And so it does take a, a specific approach, a different type of approach to spark interest as in your bringing value versus doing a general sales call. And so depending on the inquiry, you know, if, if you're doing an outbound or if it's in, in inbound, there, in my opinion, there are two hats to wear. And you have to be fully engaged with not only the prospect's intent, meaning what their driving force is in order to better engage with them, but to really read the the scenario, if you will, kind of just the momentum of the phone conversation, the tonality or what have you. So I believe that that at the same time, though, it can be an, an advantage for a salesman to be good at selling over the phone because it just requires that that individual to make contact. And so if they're able to make contact by phone or by text or by, let's say, Skype, then they're then they're able to think outside the box rather than be forced to go and visit that specific location and thus eat up more time from that from that salesman. It seems like there's a balance here of clearly it's easier to get someone on the phone and you've got all the objections of setting a meeting and meeting someone in person anyway. And then there's clearly objections and things that can crop up on the phone and people can perhaps eject from that socially a bit cleaner than they can from just standing up, walking out of a room and slamming the door behind them. So when we're talking about getting to the point of negotiating with someone on the phone, is there anything that we should do before we call? Is there any prep that we should do before we even kind of ring that individual to mitigate some of the potential excuses or objections that they've got for negotiating at that time? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I did a sales training last week for the newer uh, licensed agents who are coming onto my sales floor. And the sales training was called Gates of the Sale. And ultimately what it, is, what it acts is gate one through gate 10, for example, it, it reminds you of what specific phases of the conversation must be complete. And the very first gate was just a mental check, kind of a, be mentally ready. And I think that plays an important role because when you're in a tail, when you're in a call center environment and you're receiving inbound calls from not only a call center, but also past prospects, it's very easy to bring in the emotional baggage from your past call. And so I think that it's important that the salesman really reset their mindset, if you will, and, and just really go hyper-focused within the prospect that's in front of them. And I think that in itself will already set you levels of, uh, ahead of your competition, primarily because you're engaged in listening with that prospect. And I hear it too many times or too often I see sales representatives just go in and they're more um, kind of like a like a closer mentality. Like they're very aggressive. They're not being really considerate of the prospect. And until that prospect feels that you hear them or you're you're actually engaged with how to help them, they're going to view you as a as a quote unquote salesman. Okay, so one, how do we get into this uh, I guess neutral mood before we ring, or you know, positive mood? Essentially, leave the last phone call or the last uh, conversation behind, or the last five minutes of your sales manager kicking your ass because you're not calling enough people. One, how do we leave that behind? And then two. You mentioned um, the two hats, one of them being scenario. How do we then, once we've got on the call, start to understand where our prospect is and where their mindset is? Because it seems like there's two battles here, getting ourselves right and then 
either influencing them to be in the right frame of mind or calling them back at a better time. Yeah, absolutely. I think first and foremost that the salesman needs to realize that that most of the prospects calling in or even if it was a, an outbound call, the prospect themselves have no idea what's going to happen next. Whereas the salesman has a primary advantage of it being a re repetitive process. And so, th and so my answer, I, I guess, Will, is, is that repetition is key. It's really understanding your scripting. It's understanding your, your set of words to, to initially engage the phone conversation, but, but know it in a way where it's de your delivery of your initial opening script is, is, is on autopilot. So it's it's coming out, but your your awareness is paying attention to several things. It's paying attention to the background of the prospect, if they're in a noisy environment. Um, it's paying attention to the tonality of the prospect. And so if the tonality is 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 fast and in a rush, then you'll have an idea of what type of engagement you're about to about to have rather than a prospect who is more than willing to take the time to speak with the salesman because they have questions. And so reading both it, uh, 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 scenarios or environments is very important. But um, where, where it comes in handy in terms of, of resetting yourself or, or getting back in that frame of mind is really just looking at that the initial sales conversation is actually where the sale happens. Where a lot of salesmen believe the sale actually happens in the pitch I'm, I'm a firm believer that it actually happens in the initial sales conversation because that's where you're able to extract the information that ultimately sells them in the second or the second call because I do a two call close. Um, you know, I, I believe that that in our climate, at least within my industry, it's important to set up a second call close for variable reasons for, for not just for the prospect as well as a salesman to fully absorb the content and the information gathered in the initial call. But it's also important within my industry to make sure that all decision makers are present at the time of, of releasing your pitch or doing your sales presentation. Okay. So multiple things here, um, for the sale to happen, what's going on in that conversation and is for the sale, is the sale happening a light bulb moment? Is that a switch? where we're looking for the, the prospect's mind to go, okay, I'm moving forward with this. And then the rest of it is just like, almost academic, is just going through the motions, is probably objections coming up just so they look like they're doing due diligence. Or is it not as clear cut as that? Sure, good question. So, it, you know, with a, with a call center environment, you have calls coming in from multiple sources, typically from a call center, like a customer service department, which will do outbound calls. They'll also accept inbound calls. And so you typically have three sources of leads, internet inquiries, mailer leads, which are basically mail solicitation, um, you know, hits a homeowner and then the homeowner opens it up and then they respond back. Well, that's a different type of lead versus someone who actually fills out an online inquiry. Well, at the same time, those two are different from a prospect that you would engage with on an outbound call. And so I believe that that when you when you're at least able to understand not only the lead source, but have have an have an understanding that every engagement really in the bare bones of it all is someone is on the other line looking to, to solve a specific problem. And when they call in from a prospect standpoint, whether it's, whether it's business consumer or business to business, anytime there is an engagement with a salesman or what they perceive as a salesman, that individual will be on guard ultimately because society has wired us this way. Society, social media, TV, our elders, they've all wired us in a way to be scarce, to protect ourselves and, and put up initial guards in certain scenarios, one of those scenarios being in front of a salesman. And so I, I believe that the, the, the hack to it, if you will, is to engage with that, with that prospect as a consultant rather than a salesman. And there are two different, you know, when you, when you think back of when you actually engage with a salesman, you, you, you will be, you'll be aware of how, of how guarded you are, of, of how, of how you put a sense of, of, you know, like, uh, like you're trying not to give too much information. You don't want to show your cards because you'll feel that you'll be sold. Whereas if you're speaking to a consultant, for example, let's say a doctor or an accountant, some sort of subject matter expert, there is a different 
engagement with that with that resource. So with a consultant, you're you're under the impression that you're speaking with a professional who can help you. And it's important to relay that to the prospect or they'll feel that they're on guard and it'll be very difficult for the salesman to extract the right pieces of information to make a sale. And so the first engagement when it comes to let, let I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I, I've, I've watched many of your shows and I know a lot, a lot of the individuals you interview, they all agree that, um, you know, objections, for example, is a very common thing that every salesman uh, experiences in their engagement. And objections are, are cyclical. They, they happen all the time, specifically, you know, usually at around the same exact time. And they're usually the same. They may not sound the same, but they're usually within the same bracket. Like I don't have time or I'm not in the market or I'm okay with my servicer right now. And they have these specific objections where, where if a salesman were to pay attention to them and actually make note of them, they'll, they'll actually recognize that it happens around the same exact time. And after so many attempts, the salesman has the advantage of reframing their, their script or their wording so that they're actually handling the objection before it even occurs. And so I have, I have multiple uh, training videos on my channel at Sales Remastered where I actually share, um, you know, like, like uh, there's a week where I did um, outbound call generation. So every single day of every week I did, I released a 15, 20 minute video where I shared different tactics on how to generate sales on an outbound call. But then I did another week where I, I taught different techniques and strategies on inbound calls. And these are two different lead types and two different engagements where if the, if the salesman does not take consideration of their past experience from their past engagements, they're, they're naturally going to be caught off guard. And until the salesman actually adapts to that specific engagement, it's always going to be a sale. It's not going to be a consultation. Are we talking real practically that we've got a notebook on our desk next to us and every time an objection comes up, no matter what it is, we write it down. At the end of the week, we review it. And then we ask ourselves, you know, what's the common similarities? How can I negate these before they come up? Because if you're giving someone information that stops them asking an objection, you are literally adding value to them. You're solving a bit of a problem part of the puzzle before it even crops up, before they have to mentally process it. So are we literally writing all this down and we've got, like I've got here, a big wad of paper that, you know, two or three years in, we know, we note it down into kind of like five, six objections that always crop up. Is that the goal with this? Yes. Essentially what you're doing is you're, you're mapping out your conversations so you know when specific objections pop up. And so probably a way to, to start your map is that you know maybe you draw a line right down the middle of a piece of paper, for example, and on the left hand side you have it, you have your introduction call or your initial sales conversation, and then on the right hand side you have your sales presentation or your sales pitch, and along the left hand side you would just simply notate what objections commonly occur. And so one of my objections that commonly occur is what's your bottom line rate or what's your bottom line fee. I don't want to give you any information, just what is your cost? And that's something that we always have to, you know, have to have to overcome. And then as this as the sales conversation comes up, other uh, other objections will pop up like, um, oh, I can get it cheaper here or I don't want to give my Social Security number. There's certain objections that happen at at certain points of your conversation that you can jot down. And you'll notice that after a while, it really does narrow itself down to about three or four common objections and then there will be another one which will be a little bit more advanced like um, like what i call situational objections these are specific situational objections that only happen in specific situations so they're not as common as what's your rate or what's your fee or i don't have time they're actually specific to a, to a pocket or a niche or maybe a particular product and so those will only happen when when applicable but if you you know if you for example i have a sales script available on my website and it's free and it, it really enables the the salesman to dismantle the guard and immediately take control of the conversation whereas a lot of salesmen who are receiving inbound calls for example they'll they'll naturally give the mic back to the prospect and what i mean by that is they'll do their quick introduction for example they say hey my name is daniel it's a great day at my company um how you know how are you today and that's giving the microphone back to the prospect and ultimately setting the precedence and the, the momentum of that conversation. 
And what I found is that when you start your conversation that way, where you give them the mic, whether you ask them how's their day or, or what are your goals or how can I help you, ultimately you give them the microphone. You're putting them in the driver's seat. And so if that prospect says, hey, you know, I don't I don't have any time to answer your questions. I'm just looking for your lowest rate. I'm just looking for your lowest price. Give me that information. And I'll let you know if if I'll go forward with this phone conversation. Well, let's, well let, me, the- let me jump in here a second, Daniel, because there are two common objections that even in medical device sales I've come across. So perhaps you can give us real practically how you overcome them of uh, kind of what's the, the lowest price as in someone for me in the, dealing with the NHS in the UK, it would be procurement officer just shopping for the lowest price because someone's already won the business. They just need to build a case around it to show that the price is already is already acceptable. So that's one objection I've come up against. And then the the other one of, um, I can't read my own handwriting here, so you'll have to remind me. So there was the, what's your lowest price? And then okay, I think it was the base rate you were talking about as well. Yes. Yes. It's so always, how, uh, how would you very practically, personally, I guess, overcome both of those? Sure. So those are those are actually questions that I come about. Um, it's just it's just worded differently from the prospect, such as I'm happy with my current vendor or my servicer. And that would be similar to the objection that you have. And so um, but I would not be blocked by that objection unless I allowed myself to be blocked by that objection. And so my scripting, for example, would be like, hey, Will, I appreciate you giving me a call. What I'm going to do is just ask a few basic questions, and this is going to let me know if I can even provide any benefit. If I can, I'm going to show you exactly what I can do. But if I can't, at least maybe I'll point you in the right direction and then go right into the qualification, right, or the application. And what I've found is that is that whoever you're speaking with, whether it's a it's a business title or it's a consumer, you're you're dealing with someone who's very appreciative of their time. And if you can become emotionally aware to what drives that particular person, then you can have enough emotional intelligence to read what motivates that person. And what I've found is that no matter what, typically when a consumer or a business engages with a vendor or salesman, what they're what they're thinking is, how can I get this person off the phone with me? <laughs> you know, how can I get them out of the way? How can I how can I make some random excuse to get this person off the phone? until that salesman has inside information. And I think that would be something that you can use to get in. So for example, if you were selling medical devices or medical equipment to a company and I was privy enough to know that that company was to use a competitor of mine, I would script my my wording in a way where it's like, hey, you know what? I know you're doing business with this other vendor. Just real quick, um, I'm just going to make sure if I can provide any 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 different value than what you're accepting now. Because what I have found are those who used to work with them chose me because of A, B, and C. And so what you're doing is you're just you're doing research. Of course, you're you're gathering intel on your particular prospect where you're know you're knowing their their sweet spots, for example. So if they went to this particular vendor, but they didn't like their delivery time or they didn't like the customer service or they didn't like, you know, certain uh, 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 bits about that particular ben- vendor. And these are th- this is stuff you can gather online. You know, you can gather information online very easily from their reviews and their in their and, and it, uh, companies that work with them in the past. And you can use that as your as your way in. But when you come in with value, like there's a, there's this always saying, like, always bring value. It's no longer about always be closing. It's always bring value. Well, that value is inside information. The reason why, you know, uh, reality TV, the reason why vlogs are very popular is because it's inside information. You're able to act like a, a fly on the wall and see things that you or learn things that you normally would not learn. And so if you if you're able to figure out what inside information do you have that your your clients or your prospects would really appreciate just knowing now that's value and that creates the bond where you become the go-to. So if that Daniel is the hook that on the first kind of 10, 15 se- seconds, the first few sentences, we want to show the person that we're calling that we have some kind of inf- inside information or p- potentially we do. So for me, medical devices, it'd be, I've just been to the hospital next door. The surgeon's doing things one way. You might like to know how he's doing it as well. That's I'd use that every time I'd go anywhere. Um, Cause I had a couple of surgeons on my patch, special colorectal surgeons who are world-class at what they're doing. So that'd get me in with every other colorectal surgeon. How do we, because I've just said about two minutes worth of, of blah there. How do we condense that down so that when you get on a phone call, it's an immediate 
hook. It's an immediate grab of their attention. What what the what's the kind of phrases we should be saying, or how can we how can we frame that up? And and do we pre-frame this perhaps in an email to arrange the phone call? I, I don't know how how is the best way to go about it. Sure, it's actually going to be against the norm. So it's not going to be your traditional method. And what I mean by traditional method is sales representatives are taught a specific way. Some of them are even taught to be a little bit cheesy, meaning like, hey, you know, if you're in the market, <laughs> have a specific tone about them, right? And that is somewhat the protocol. But if you're able to make noise in a different way, I'm confident that you can attract the business rather than chase it. And there's just there's something about that understanding where you become emotionally aware of, of, of the engagement in itself, meaning you're not looking at it as a transaction to generate a sale. You're simply looking at it as an engagement to communicate and find a problem. As a salesman, whether it's business to business or business to consumer, we are problem solvers. And the inside information typically is in line with the problem solving. And even if it is not, we have to find a way to penetrate their attention span and generate the interest to attract more, uh, more engagement, to keep them on the call. And so what I found is that, you know, the world in itself is very noisy. There's tons of alerts coming our way from email alerts, text alerts, IMs, um, billboards, pop-ups, opt-ins, our managers, KPIs. There's just, a, just so much data being thrown at us at, at any given time that we as humans have been wired to quickly process information, reject or accept. And what I've found to be easier to accept is when you have insight information, meaning that information is actually just to help you, doesn't sound like a sale. And so let's go and put that in example. So one, one particular salesman can go about their prospecting and saying, hey, medical company, how are you? You know, my name is Daniel. I'm with this medical company. And I just want to let you know I'm in the area. And I'd love to stop by and see if I can put you in an awkward state and pitch my services. You know, I'd love to come by and put you on guard if that's OK. And I think that prospecting is 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 very it's it's it sounds just like your competition. Whereas if I were to contact that same prospect and say, hey, you know what? I'm actually in the neighborhood. I'm going to visit one of my clients who actually used to work with, you know, let's say, let's name that competitive company. And, um, and while I'm there, and actually I'm meeting with them, I'd love to stop by and introduce myself and tell you why they converted to us or started using us versus them. Really good inside information. If anything, you just want to have it for your record keeping, if not direct access to what, you know, what, what the right path is. And so now that just becomes inside information, but it's you're in your way on your way anyway. Right. And so it's a little bit different in my, in my realm, in my sandbox, I have, I have consumers, homeowners calling in, or sometimes we call out and there's something where a consumer, if you give them the, in the, uh, the and it, and same thing can apply to even a business. If you give them the impression that no matter what, it's coming anyway, like, hey, I'm going to send it out to you anyway. I just want to confirm your email address and you already have their email. So, yeah, I'm actually going to go and send it. My, you know, some, the subject line will read Daniel with this medical company or Daniel, uh, you know, message for you. And and they have the impression that it's already on its way. It's easier to accept as opposed to us asking if we can send it. Makes all sense. For everyone who's listening now, Daniel, who's going, this sounds amazing. I'm going to do it right this second. But I'm new to either, either I'm new to the job and I don't really have any inside information, or I've been doing the job 20 years and due to the internet, all the content, all the information is out there. What are some practical examples of uh, quote unquote inside information that the audience could be thinking about and trying to kind of push into their own, as you described, a sandbox or their own vertical. What's a, what's a piece of inside information perhaps that you'd give your customers when you want to hook them on a phone call? Sure. So every company has their own resources, um, whether it's a medical company or a finance company, there is resources that enables the salesman to do their job right. And sometimes this information could be anything from research, uh, data gathering against competition, um, or, or it, for example, my my resource information would be comparable sales. So I have access to to information of how much the property across the street sold, and that's not real privy information, or that's not information that's necessary given online. 
it is to some degree, but there's there's just so much more information that I can gather from the resources that I'm given from my company. And so I understand this as being inside information because I have I have resources to data that can be very valuable to my prospect. Same thing would be for like credit. Everyone has a credit score. I, the credit report is something that I deal with every single day. And, you know, the audience who are watching this show can can maybe adapt it to something that they deal with every day. And and we have to realize that that information is not necessarily public information. It's not, you know, we are subject matter experts for a reason. You know, whether you got a license to sell your product or you did research to sell your product, you are a professional. And and um, <clears throat> where, let's say, credit port information, where consumers can get information anywhere, but when it's being given and, and relayed in a way that's applicable to them, it, it creates value. It's not as generic. It's actually a little bit tailor fit, it's custom made. And so the information that I would use on a daily basis or possibly even overlook and not share it with the prospect, I'm passing up on value and inside information to the prospect where they, they wouldn't necessarily know the little random tidbits or random fun facts that we may take for granted every day in, in our, you know, our daily workups or our pitch workups. I love it. So, so there's multiple layers to all this. There's information that perhaps they're just too lazy to go and Google and sort out themselves. A layer below that, there's got information that perhaps your company has gathered that might not be public. It might not be available to everyone else. And then, and I'm glad you said this, we are professionals. We are doing whatever you're selling. You, even if you think you don't know that much about it, you probably know more about it than the, the customer, the person buying, even more so than the end user, because you're doing it every every frigging day, right? You're you're in the deep end. You're speaking to customers. You're seeing what their problems are. You're hopefully solving some of them problems so you can preempt problems. This is all layers of value that if two widgets are exactly the same price to do the same thing, if you're just more interesting to talk to, <laughs> that's another layer to it all. They're going to do business with you rather than this boring sod who's just you know pestering them all the time. And I guess that's another layer. If, you're, if someone's pestering them versus you're giving them, you're, you're, you're taking care of them, you're conscious of their time, you're not spamming them, you're not making them feel weird. Again, in an age where we live in a global economy, there's lots of competition in most verticals for most products. You are the difference. You're the, the thing separating the, the the sale one way or the other, perhaps. So with all that, perhaps they're on the phone, the prospect is excited, we're, we're confident, you kind of get that little bit of a grin, perhaps there's a bit of adrenaline going, you know that like a fundamental negotiation is just about to take place, whether it's terms, whether it's delivery dates, whatever it is, and it's happening over the phone. Is there anything other than collecting data, insider information, giving more value, all these good stuff that we've covered so far, Daniel? Is there anything else that we can do to perhaps inc increase our influence, to increase the chances of the negotiation being great for both sides, essentially increase our chances of closing the sale at this point? Absolutely. I think that um, first and foremost, every sales professional watching right now must understand that we know what our background is. We understand our experience within this particular line of work. And, and that's something that only we will know. Our prospects will not know that you're one month on to the sales job. Your prospect will not know that maybe you just got out of a real bad conversation with an unhappy prospect or an unhappy client. The only way that the new prospect will know this is if we let them know. And usually we'll let them know through our own insecurities. And so it comes out in a way where we are, are defensive and we actually create the objections that we have to overcome. Meaning that we are bringing in baggage or we're bringing our, in our own insecurities that actually attract and manifest the objections and the roadblocks in our engagement. And sometimes we're, we're not aware of this because we get caught up in our, in our own heads. And so to answer your question, what are a few things that we can do? Number one is, realize that your prospect number one you know if you're doing it over the phone they can't hurt you they can't reach <laughs> over the phone and actually physically touch you and and also <clears throat> because they're not necessarily aware one thing that they could do is because they're not essentially aware of what's going to come in your engagement or how the conversation is going to work 
remember that you are in the driver's seat. So you control the engagement, you control the excitement, you control the tonality of that, of that conversation. Where I see a lot of uh, sales representatives tend to fail or, or, or hit a lot of roadblocks and have a hard time in producing sales is because they treat every engagement as a sale. They don't treat it as an engagement with a human being or just or even if it's a business, still it's a human being making the decision. Even if it's a, a multi-billion dollar medical device company, at the end of the day, behind the decision making, there's an individual. There's one person making that decision and that individual is, is on guard to protect their status. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of us as salesmen tend to, um, you know, technically fail in sales because we're so worried about protecting our status that we uh, we try to protect ourselves from objections. And when we understand that no matter what, every engagement we have, an objection is just going to come. We have to be aware of this and accept it. We will no longer be on guard. And that's when our, our whole demeanor changes. Our, we're, we're no longer playing on defense. We're actually on offense, meaning we're there to help. And, and when you have that tonality, when you have that type of engagement, they sense that. And so if you have someone who's on the phone and this, this goes back with pacing, like there's a strategy that I, that I refer to as pacing. And I have my sales agents consider all the time because we deal with people of wide arrays of, of personalities. You know, you're, it's just, you're dealing with different type of personalities, different type of speeds and momentums and experiences. And what I think has allowed my team to be so successful is that they're constantly working on their emotional intelligence, meaning that they're aware of what's driving the prospect on the other side. And typically it's not rate or fees. It's not the objection they tell you. It's, it's it, what it is, is that they're guarded to ensure that they, they make the right choice to ultimately protect their status. Whether it's protect their status as a homeowner, protect their status as a business owner, they're ultimately trying to protect themselves away from a salesman. And so a few things that you can do, um, besides just remembering that your prospect has no idea of what's going to happen in the engagement you drive, you're more of a tour guide, right? So if they're following you, if you imagine interacting with a tour guide, that tour guide is going to show you all everywhere, all the attractions, they know what's to come, they know what's ahead, and, and the people with the tour guide are following the tour guide. So if you keep it in that realm, whereas you're going to, you may run into delays or issues if the tour guide never kept moving forward, they never kept moving to the attraction, but they just kept standing there and looking at you <laughs> like any other questions, but they, they never moved forward. And so we have this chance where we can become a tour guide or a consultant and show them the right path to get to the desired destination. Or we could just stand there kind of like a sales rep at Target or Best Buy, you know, you know, like a retail outfit that just comes up to you and says, hey, how can can I help you find something? There's something about that sound. There's something about that tone that makes us want to say no. You know, not too many people are like, yeah, absolutely. Can you help me find this? And, you know, because they're engaging with a salesman. Same thing with like if you're on a car lot, you know, you see the salesman walking up to you. You get this feeling as a consumer like, oh, no, I'm going to get sold. I'm going to be solicited. We have to be emotionally aware of what that is so that we can connect with that individual on a different level and dismantle that guard. So final thing on this. If you, and this will hopefully wrap up the show here because I think I know where you'll go with it, Daniel. If you had to put a percentage on it, how much of success selling on the phone, negotiating over the phone is down to the frame, your mindset, the fact that you weren't in a horrible mood and in traffic this morning and couldn't leave it to behind? How much of it, how much of a percentage of success on the phone is, is dealing with all that and how much of it is some kind of magical script? or some kind of hack or something else slightly more intangible that, you know, I, I cover stuff like that on the show all the time, but how much of it is mindset? And how much of it is the, the screen that you're looking at as you read it off? Sure. I think uh, a lot of it has to do with mindset. Um, you know, on my digital course, the very first module is going to be specifically around mindset because it's important to have the right discipline, have the right uh, mental focus to overlook certain things. And what I mean by certain things is, is typically has to do with fear of engaging with a prospect, fear of being declined or, or rejected, while at the same time having enough mental fortitude and in the right attitude to, 
to understand that even in a call center or work environment, if your colleagues or your coworkers are having issues or they're venting, to have the right mindset to stay away from that and actually still write your own ticket. Just because your colleagues or your team are having trouble with a specific lead type or they're having a bad day or they're not as motivated as you, having the right mindset will keep you on your own track and not allow you to sway and do what everyone else is doing. Because the truth of the matter is that in any sales environment, you're going to have different, you know, uh, different producers. You're going to have producers that typically hover around the top consistently. You're going to have you have producers that are around the middle and they're just, you know, they're 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 meeting quota. They're doing just good enough to stay off the radar. And then you consistently have the individuals who are below par and below average. And the trick is, how do I infiltrate the network that always hangs around the top? How can I mirror their mirror their actions, not necessarily stop them and ask them to mentor you, but you just simply watch them. You network with people they network and you research them. And so we have within our area a, a, a clear example of how to properly do it. But what happens is maybe may, maybe it's easier to give in to the lower level because it's not as you know, it's not as demanding. You don't have to work as many hours. You don't, you know, you can go home and go watch Netflix for a couple <laughs> hours before you go to sleep. So the right mindset is going to, is going to continuously challenge you. It's going to, it's going to enable you to do things like a morning ritual, which is one of the strongest things that I would recommend to anyone who's in sales, because sales is a mental game. It is a mental sport. It can, it can ruin you or it can make you and develop you into the person that you want to be. Fortunately, sales is, is all communication. So even if you're communicating with your wife, your spouse, your kids, or a business or consumer, it is a sale. And your, your, your intent behind that message, whether you want them to respond, react, comply, or buy, it is, it is an engagement. And so when we, when we step back and realize this, then, then we're, we're able to open our eyes to understand how and why things you know, operate the way they do, why people make decisions the way they make their decisions. And so my, my, my answer to you is, is, is it has to do a lot with mindset, but at the same time, scripting and training will help you. They have a saying where it's called, uh, you know, hustle, hustle, like the mindset, right? Hustle will help you catch up, whereas training will help you keep it. And training is, is constant uh, practicing of your craft, whether it's reading books, following great influencers online like Salesman Podcast, you know, at Sales Remastered or influencers who are who you feel will 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 push you to that next level and have the right attitude to continue doing it, even though sometimes in your environment people are not following that same suit. So it, it, it does take a lot about mindset and it and and the scripting is is really wordplay in, in my in my opinion is very important. Because there are certain timing and, and ways that you could frame your delivery where, for example, if I was pitching you, Will, and let's say if you're, you're in the middle of a sales presentation, the, the placement of the fee or the cost of your service before you, you, you bring their emotional state to its peak level, because anyone and everyone buys based off of emotion, but then will justify it through logic. And where I see a lot of sales presentations go south is because they focus on the price first. They focus on the logistics first, whereas then they'll go into the emotional side. So as to say, hey, I got this product for you. It's $1,000, but it does this and this and this and this and this. The prospect just heard the $1,000. They didn't hear anything that happened afterwards. So if you were just simply re reverse that and say and, and, and be emotionally aware to get their emotional state at a peak level and then show them the cost or the price as the vehicle to get to that result, you'd have far more effectiveness in, in dealing with that engagement or, or, or concluding that pitch. And it all has to do with with the presentation and the timing you know, of that sequence. Makes total sense. And with that last example, I really appreciate that as well, Daniel, in that... I always think of it of if you say it's a thousand dollars and then you start telling them why, they're going, Well, that's that's twenty dollars worth of value, that's thirty dollars worth of value, that's two hundred dollars, and they're working backwards from that end result that you've already given them. Whereas you go the other way around, and as as you alluded to then, and we all know this because we've all done it, we've all you know, rightly or wrongly, we've all bought stuff that perhaps we shouldn't have. So we've been through this experience of getting excited, 
I nearly did it with a sodden new BMW the other day. I was looking at getting a BMW M4. Do not need one. It's all waste of money. The car I've got at the moment is almost as fast, not to 60. And I was getting myself emotionally wrapped up in what what an M4 means. That it's gonna, it's just a bigger car, it's more luxurious, there's a lovely leather dash in it. And then as soon as you pull the emotion away from it, you go, oh no, wait, that 30 grand, spend it on the business, keep growing, and then you can have whatever car you want in the future. And I was I myself was getting wrapped up in this emotional roller coaster. So you know, you, clearly you can use this for the, the good or the dark side, I guess, if you're on the phone, but clearly getting that emotion wrapped up and, and getting them wrapped up and excited before prices is even just considered is clearly important. And with that, Daniel, one question, mate. Are there any books, resources, and we, we could touch on your content in a second as well, uh, books, resources, videos, is there anything you'd recommend to someone who's listening to this show who then wants to know more about selling on the phone and, and getting better at that negotiation process. Yes, absolutely. I, uh, with regards to, to books and negotiations, I uh, happen to be in the process of establishing a brand, which is the Ad Sales Remastered. So I'm now collecting information on the resources that we have, such as YouTube, Facebook, social media, and how to fuse it in as a salesman to become a brand and create a community. Um, but it, along the process, it's, you know, to create content, I start to dive into the subject matter. And so I'm reading books right now. The current sales book that I'm on is uh, from Jordan Belfort, which is, uh, you know, it's called The, Sh the Way of the Wolf. And he's, he's the character behind uh, Wolf of Wall Street. And everyone will have their own kind of perception of him right? Like, oh, he was a drug dealer or a drug addict. And, and he did a lot of wrong to a lot of people. And, um, at, but when you, when you break away, you know, the, what he did ultimately was create a process that was easy enough to have multiple people study and just follow. And what I appreciate about that book is it is, is his process called the straight line is it, is it outlines and just tells you exactly what to do. Do you just take them straight to the goal? Where, where as like a lot of salesmen are kind of in the process of just more or less answering questions, like, is there anything I can help you with? You know, is there, you know, is there any questions you have for me or would you like to, an to, to ask any questions? And the prospects, if they don't have any questions or they're, if they feel like it's up to them or they're in the driver's seat, they're more inclined to take the alternative and stop the engagement altogether and say, oh, no, I'm OK right now. I'll go and think about it because it's easier for them. Whereas the straight line, it just tells you to continuously take them towards the end and you have to, you have to bring them sometimes. And, and I think that's what sales is about is, you know, I share a lot of techniques on my channel, um, very persuasive techniques, and it's not meant to take advantage of a consumer. What we have to do, it's our, our fiduciary duty to help our prospects and persuade them in a way that they tell us the information that we need to know to do right by them. Whereas if we don't know the information that will help our prospect, all we're helping is ourselves. We're helping ourselves make a sale. We're helping ourselves hit a tier. We're helping ourselves make a bonus. And we're forgetting the true value of long-term success in this business. And it's that your prospect needs to feel taken care of. Because when they feel that they're taken care of and that they're looked out for, that word spreads. And that word goes to their network. It goes to their family. It goes to their friends. And now you're attracting business. But that is one book. And then um, another one, which is actually really interesting, is a book called Expert Secrets from Russell Brunson. You may have heard of the book. And, it, and what, what I found after reading that book is even though it's set up in a way to, to create online marketing, it actually tells you how decisions are being made. It tells you how to sell people through storytelling. And I think storytelling is obviously a fan favorite because it's easy for a prospect to to get engaged with a story. Not only that, but but they, you know, it's just naturally human beings will be more attracted to hear about what other people went through. And that's why reviews are popular. That's why reality TV is popular. You get to see a story. So I will link to both of those books in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. Side note of, I actually interviewed Jordan not too long ago. It was the worst interview I've ever done the whole my life. And I assume it might, it'll probably, he wants to come out on a certain day. So it'll come out after your one, Daniel. So I'll link that in the show notes when it does as well. Um, and the audience can make up their mind of how he is as a individual themselves <laughs> after that interview. And with that, mate, tell us a little bit about Sales Remastered, where we can find it, where we can find out more about you as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Sales Remastered is uh, it's available on YouTube. It's available on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. LinkedIn is under my name. But if you go to salesremastered.com, at the bottom of the home page, we'll have all the social media links that it's available on, as well as access to the free script that I was just sharing with you. Um, and, it, and it has a lot, it, it shares with you and the audience the, the strategy behind Sales Remastered. And again, as a full disclosure, the, the process and the strategies behind are very persuasive. And, I, and I, do, I do make a disclosure that I trust in the audience to do right with the information and techniques that they learn, to not use it for, for anything but goodwill towards the prospects, because it is information that will really captivate the attention and help you drive a message. And depending on the integrity of that salesperson and, and the character of that salesperson, uh, my only hope is that it gets into the right hands and it does good for the prospects out there and the consumers out there. It's very important to me. But Sales Remaster can be found on all social media platforms. Uh, I have a blog, which, uh, which I do write at salesremaster.com forward slash blog, and it shares information. I'm, I'm currently in the process of working on my digital content, which will be hosted by Kajabi, and it's going to share uh, with sales uh, professionals all throughout the world how to properly negotiate over the phone. And if you can if you can understand how to engage, negotiate, and drive a message by phone, that is one of the absolute most powerful ways to sell because you're not doing it in person. You're actually engaging. So in other words, if you could do it good on the phone, you're going to be amazing in person. And 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 yeah. So you'll be able to learn about all that at salesremaster.com. Good. Well, I'll link that in the show notes to everyone who's driving or at the gym at the moment listening to this. And with that, Daniel, I want to thank you for the time. I want to thank you for, you've got a unique spin on some of this, which is interesting to me. So I appreciate that. You've obviously well thought this through. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you very much, Will. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for watching.